She called me for troubleshooting. <laughs> she said, oh, did not work. So I advised her, Alt plus F4. She says, yay, finally someone came to her aid. And then when she tried it, no. So of course, this was the most hilarious thing in the world when she realizes it closed everything. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a menace to society. One of the greatest ever fictional aspects of a character is the menace to society character. As someone that finds society incredibly cringe, a bit of Jojo posing and menacing every once in a while definitely goes a long way to lighten my mood. Now, if you're anything like me, you don't want to be bored by some long intro now defining menaces to society because you see, the beauty of this archetype is that People could be a threat to society in so many fashions. Either they're feared or they're loved, but they will betray you. Maybe they just don't care. Maybe they have their own goals that clashes with society, and maybe they just have a sense of humor. Oh, anything but that. Oh, God. Today, we will be breaking down the various types of major menaces to society in seven different chapters for this video. This is the deepest of dives that no one ever expected to obtain on a topic that no one ever knew that they desperately needed. So, because we are covering the seven different sides, the seven deadly sins of menaces to society, we will be referring to characters that I think perfectly exemplify that very archetype of menace, and we will be using that as the token character to discover exactly how to crumble society around you. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you the magnum opus on the greatest menaces of fictional history. Allow me to ask you a question. Why does every RPG in the universe end up killing God somehow? Well, before you actually answer that, allow me to tell you about a special RPG that is sponsoring this video. Omni Heroes. Omni Heroes is here, baby! In this mobile game, the Valkyries have been dragged into the darkness by the demons, and you are tasked to become an Omni Guardian to save them. You formulate strategic teams with over 100 heroes and three different types of synergies in a fantastic world with even more fantastic chesticles. God, I hope I'm allowed to keep that in. In this story, you gotta got to get to know a whole bunch of characters. For example, Dorabella, the arcane mage with exceptional magic powers and is known as the brain of the empire. Formulate your teams, level them up, unlock new abilities, over 100 heroes, and 17 synergies at the tap of a finger. Omni Heroes is available on both the Apple App Store and Google Play. Omni Heroes is the ultimate playground for all thrill seekers and treasure hunters out there. Join a guild, test your luck on random chests. There are a lot of really great chests in this game. I play this game for chests and chests only, personally, but also collect your legendary artifact fragments that'll elevate your powers even further. So you, yeah, you right there. Download now. Click the link in the description to claim 777 pulls and secure a minimum of five legendary heroes. Link in the description. Omni Heroes, thank you so much for sponsoring this video. Very often, you have rankings to how terrifying a certain being is in a certain universe. You've heard different classifications being S rank, A rank, B rank, disaster level threat, god level threat. Every single world, every single universe has its system to delineate exactly how dangerous and how threatening your opponent might be. The character that I am about to talk about is a character so terrifying, so menacing, that he has devised his very own classification of threat level that throws the entire world out of balance. Above every threat level we've seen thus far, the fourth Hokage from Naruto, Minato Namikaze, has been given the status of flee on sight. Now picture this, you're in the middle of a war. You're trying to win this war, obviously, by the fact that you're in the middle of it. But if you see Minato, flee on sight. Don't try to fight, don't try to struggle, flee on sight. This was the birthing place of Minato, the menace. <laughs> No! 
normally speaking, when you're building up an anime character, the best way to go about it is to build up an anime character that's gonna become a major player in the future that we haven't seen yet, that hasn't really been around yet, that's present hasn't really been known yet. So we spend a lot of time crafting and building up a brilliant anime character to terrorize the world at some future event. Well, look no further, lads. Minato, my boy, has gotten so much hype and build up talking about him before we ever learn anything about him, before we even see him in a flashback, or before we knew anything about his relevance to the actual plot. All we knew about him was that there was this nine-tailed fox and this dude sacrificed his life to seal it away. That's what we know from the very first episode, so we know the guy's a badass. But as the story goes on, little by little, more and more things are dribbled into your mouth, where you could slowly but surely start to learn about the menace that is Minato. When they talk about the people who've gotten the highest scores in the history of the Leaf Village, you know that Itachi got the second highest score in history, surpassed by Minato, the fourth Hokage. As you continue proceeding, and Jiraiya is teaching Naruto this legendary Rasengan that only like three people in history have ever mastered, you learn that it was invented by Minato, the fourth Hokage. When you have this dude, Orochimaru, basically a terrorist pedophile terrorizing the Leaf Village in the most horrible of fashions, fighting the third Hokage in this epic clash where the third Hokage has been revered until now as the strongest ninja in the Lee Village, this absolute mad lad beast of a dude, and in that very same fight, Hiruzen whips out a jutsu, the Reaper Death Seal, a legendary technique so powerful and terrifying, even Orochimaru never heard of it, nor did he have a way to counter it, and guess what, bitches? It was invented by the fourth Hokage. I have spent this much time trying to describe to you how menacing this man is despite being dead. 12 years before the story started. When we actually learn about who he was when he was alive, you do learn that this man had the flea on sight tagline that no matter what, even in the midst of an all out war with opposing ninja countries fighting for their very survival and future, it still wasn't worth picking a fight with Minato because there is no way you can recoup those losses. I feel like by the time Minato was actually introduced in flashbacks and also that, you know, he sealed part of himself into Naruto when he sealed the Nine Tails, which is like the most badass thing in the universe, this man has been hyped up to oblivion and he does not disappoint even for the slightest of seconds. I still think to this day, the flying Raijin Jutsu is probably one of, if not the most badass Jutsus in all of Naruto. He makes every fight look like a chess game where he's playing chess and his opponent is playing chess also, but his opponent is XQC when he is Hikaru Nakamura. In his flashbacks alone, when you have him up against A and B, two incredibly hyped up and powerful ninjas that we've each seen perform the most epic of flexes by that point when we actually got the flashbacks with A completely manhandling Susano Sasuke at the Five Kage Summit and with B fighting the entire Team Taka and manhandling Sasuke. <laughs> I'm just noticing how often Sasuke gets mad at throughout the series. But the point is, these two guys were no joke and they got absolutely humiliated by Minato and they actually fight the guy. Minato is such a menace that he never postures, he never promotes himself as a mad lad. He is a humble dude that's just terrifying in every possible way because no matter how fast you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter how smart you are, you are always going to be one step behind him in battle. He sees Kakashi using Chidori, this incredibly fast jutsu to the point that it's fast enough that it can cut lightning in half. It's too fast for Kakashi's eyes to even keep up with. He needs to have the shining on before using it. Minito immediately recognizes the flaw in the jutsu. He immediately stops the jutsu. He immediately says, bro, you can't pull this off, but obviously Mirato would be able to because he's faster than the entire thing. Dude, this man's wild. It's like every single character that we get through the entire story, through the entire show, only exist as slight feats to show you how terrifying Minato actually is and why he is so worthy of the name, a ninja, that when you see him, you flee on sight. I decided to talk about Minato as a menace because I was kind of reminded by how absolutely mad lad of a fellow this guy is because they recently released a one-shot manga. It's like a 55-page manga of Minato. It's like a backstory when he's still a teenager and he's able to cancel out tailed beast bombs with single Rasengans. He's able to fly and ride and teleport people away. He just straight up pulls off feats that Naruto post-pain can't even do. And he's just so humble about it. He's just some dude. He's just some guy being dude. He's just one of the boys being one of the boys. And I think that just adds to his mystique and terror. If he was someone that actually went around threatening people, destroying people, being a menace to society in public and in the forefront, yes, everyone would recognize he's so scary, but he at least had to do something to have people recognize that fact. 
See, even in the same series, other characters that are recognized as some sort of menace, they're all actively going out of their way to do things to disrupt everything. In order for the Akatsuki to be considered a world-level threat, they literally had to invade a summit of the five Hokage and assassinate John F. Kennedy for the second time, where Minato is just some guy being dude, except if you see him, you flee on sight. His humility is, in my opinion, what makes him so absolutely menacing and terrifying. We recognize him as the threat that he is, despite the fact that this man does everything in his power to just be looked at as some regular guy that, you know, has a big heart and loves his family. This dude's like, oh man, yeah, I suck at sage mode. I, I can't do sage mode right. But then in the fight, he does sage mode and he doesn't even have like the half fusion with the frogs that Jiraiya does. This man mastered sage mode to the level that Naruto mastered sage mode in the pain fight. And he considers himself as some guy that hasn't really mastered sage mode and it's like that for everything again and again and again and i feel like it is completely worth mentioning how prudent it is that despite the fact that this man throughout the entire series has made himself like some regular guy is still recognized as the flea on site level threat that he is he uses the flying raijin jutsu and he's like oh yeah this jutsu was made by the second okage he uses the sage mode and the rasengan and he claims that they're both imperfect jutsus in one of the most wholesome panels in all of naruto which was recently released in that one shot he says to Kushina, I love you and I love that you're stronger than I am, which obviously can be represented by state of mind and stuff, but it really goes to show how just humble and good of a man Minato is. Now, maybe I'm only saying this with a mouth full of cock because I absolutely love this man. The fact that he is such a humble man that is looked at as such a world level threat by every other party and every other nation, not only in his own time, but even in future generations that they didn't want him getting summoned. This dissidence in perspectives from the guys that knew him to the guys that feared him, in my humble opinion, gives him, and I say this with no prejudice, the title of one of the biggest menaces in anime. Also, this man literally moved faster than Obito's Kamui. Do you see this? He, he just flips. Obito can freaking, but he, he's, he's faster than Kamui. Have, we have never seen something like this ever. That's insanity. Can you imagine if there was a story? A story that was very solid in all regards. There were threats coming from every angle. There are demons, there are humans, there are fights for survival. There is an impending doom and apocalypse on the horizon. There are so many fears that cower in the darkness that someday they might rear their ugly head and humanity would be destroyed. Through heaven and through earth, there are so many things to fear, so much for our main characters to grow, so much for them to overcome, and so much of your search history that you will need to delete before the apocalypse. But what if there was one piece on the chessboard that changed the entire equation? What if I told you that everything I just told you is not technically true and not a mindset that people could have because of one single entity that changes the name of the entire game? What if I told you that between heaven and earth, he alone is the I've watched a lot of anime over my years. The shonen genre is specifically one of my favorite genres and definitely one that I've spent a lot of time in. But ducks, shonen isn't the genre, it's a demographic. And to that I say, shut the fuck up, you can make your own goddamn videos. In almost every single one of these shonen anime, you have your main character who's some schnook, some brat, some bitch that has to become someone of reputed fame in his era. Someone that actually has to become strong enough to face the insurmountable seeming evils that face him and be in countless positions where he could have sex with the main girl but decides not to because he's a virgin cuck imp incel guy. Not projecting at all, but these are relatable characters. But in this sexless existence of the main character in a shonen, when you have a mentor character, a powerful figure that is a good guy, because every single one of them has, they are normally incredibly dope. If you look at famous shonen like Naruto, every couple of arcs you're introduced to a new mentor character that was even more badass than the previous mentor characters. In the beginning it was Kakashi, then it was Haruzen, then it was Jiraiya, so on and so forth. There's the, always this mentor character that's gonna be like the S tier of the actual world until Naruto eventually takes that mantle himself and becomes the strongest character in his verse. The same formula goes for pretty much every single shonen ever. So when you have a character like Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen as 
against, you know, this incredibly powerful, overpowered dude. I mean, it's not really something to be surprised about. You have All Might in My Hero Academia, but he's not on my legendary tennis series. Between heaven and earth. Because you see, in every single other one of these series, due to plot reasons or relative power scaling reasons, the main overpowered mentor guy is gonna get crept out. <laughs> Whether it's any other one of these guys that fits that mantle of overpowered mentor-like or mentor-adjacent characters that are incredibly strong, but for whatever reason are not going to be the solution to every problem ever, you have Gojo, who stands out as a very, very different type of character. When you have these incredibly powerful characters struggling with their opponents throughout their very own series, which is very nice and cool, you have Gojo absolutely stepping on, stomping, and crushing the balls of every single other person he faces, and me, who has done extensive research research on Rule 34 for this very video. The reason that this man is classed as a menace to society, one of the biggest menaces in anime, is simply because he, unlike every other one of his colleagues, alone is the honored one. If you compare all those other mentor characters in every other show to basically all the villains, the top echelon of villain will always be relatively equivalent to that top mentor character in that given stage. But you see, in all of these other anime, the main character who's always going to be weaker than that mentor character in the early stages of the show, they want to do everything they can to help this mentor character. And they usually do in some way or another. Either they're keeping someone occupied or they're taking on a threat that's going on at the same time as the uber fight that's going on between your mentor character. But you see, with Gojo, it's really not like that. With Gojo, every threat in the world becomes much less of a threat just due to this man's existence. It doesn't come down to a fight where the main character has to actually do something useful to help the overpowered mentor character. No, 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 no. My guy Gojo's a menace to society because every fight in Jujutsu Kaisen boils down to let's hold out until Gojo arrives and saves the day. There is no fight in the series that there's even a tiny, itty bitty ounce of fear of losing once Gojo shows up, so just keeping up and surviving until the Honored One appears? Well, that's really all you gotta do in the world of Jujutsu Kaisen. We talk about this epic demon Sukuna that once all the fingers are assembled and he comes back and he's a fiend and he's so scary and they're like, oh my god, Gojo, I know you're strong, but if Sukuna comes back, you beat him. Mokucho. Katsa. You see, all of the bad guys' entire plots in the entire show is finding a way to get Gojo busy somewhere else. We just want to get him out of the picture for like five goddamn minutes so we can terrorize some people. But Gojo is such a menace that the entire plot line revolves around how much of an honored one this bastard is. He's out there sitting with a blindfold to remain human. Without the blindfold, how does he even regard all of these people? This man is a complete and utter sociopath. He is terrifying in every possible way. He is a menace to friend and foe alike. His allies don't like him. His enemies don't like him. And frankly, it's because this man is a god among men. If that doesn't qualify him to be a true menace to society, I don't know what is. Every time I think of Gojo, I think of how much he tormented Volcano Head Guy to such a degree that you don't even remember Volcano Guy Head's name. When Gojo's fighting this guy, he starts off by letting the guy sneak up on him and fail to defeat him, letting the guy attack him at full power and the guy can't even touch him because the pressure is too strong once you get next to him, letting the guy unleash his full power and in middle of the fight, he leaves to go get the main character, to bring the main character so the main character can watch the fight. He lets the guy release his domain expansion shiz, and then he unleashes infinite void. Power so strong, it doesn't feel like you will ever see something in this verse that will actually surpass it. It makes you recognize exactly how big of a menace Gojo is and exactly why every bad guy's plan is let's figure out a way to do something where Gojo won't show up. This man becomes the absolute nucleus of every major event in the series and every decision made by everyone. That is how much of a menace he is. That is how terrifying this man actually is. A lot of these other mentor characters, they're all cock and no cum. They're introduced as this guy, this larger than life character, All Might, this dude that is of incredible strength and might and all that shiz. And he'll struggle in his major fights. He'll end up being victorious very often. He's definitely strong. He's definitely revered. And eventually his power level will 
will diminish entirely and will dwindle to nothingness. There's always that impending fear that when All Might's not here, or when All Might finally loses, what do we do? And you see, that fear just doesn't exist around Gojo. Gojo feels like he has surpassed any form of rational anime plot, and what's so terrifying is that he himself knows it. He is completely self-aware of exactly how much of a menace he is, and he has decided that with all of that strength, might and power, he is going to troll the ever-living shit out of everyone else, human and demon alike. He will do so in any way that he pleases, in a sociopathic anarchist way to reshape the entire world in his image. I still can't tell if he is a good guy or a bad guy, or if at some point he will somehow turn on everyone because, well, you know, he deems them unworthy to exist in the same plane of existence as he does. Whenever he's in a fight and things are going wild and it looks like he's gonna take L, he's so quick to remind everyone that you do remember that if I take my glasses off, I become a god. With chills down my spine and trepidation in my boner, I pronounce Satoru Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen as easily one of the absolute biggest oh, menaces in anime history. He's not a god among men. He's an Eldritchian entity that the human mind cannot even begin to comprehend among a swarm of bacteria. Without balance, everything collapses. There is no structure or system that could survive without some sort of balance. Any system or structure, as I've mentioned, that's been around for thousands of years has said balance, and said balance should never be thrown upon its head. In the world of One Piece, this is no different. In the last 900 years of recorded history, there has been a powerful world government, there have been constant threats of different rebellions, whether it's a revolutionary army or some pirate gaining momentum. There are always threats, there is always an oppressive government, and anarchy as well as authoritarianism can constantly clash. Throughout history, this clash has kept the One Piece world in balance. Even in the Marine Forward War, where we saw everyone at their peak strength, you saw goddamn Whitebeard, an absolute legend that I would definitely not want to lick his nipples. And I don't know why I decided to mention that at this moment specifically, facing down against the authoritarian might of a Kainu and the Marines, an entire world that's living on the brink, on the very edge, teeter-tottering, whether they are completely free or absolutely in enslavement of the government. Every world has balance and One Piece is no different, but what if I told you that there was one character whose entire tale in this story, from the very, very first episode until the very, very last, what if his story was that he shook up the very balance of power in the very world we saw? What if he created power vacuums and he is the one that filled them? What if this is a story about how Luffy becomes the pirate king and establishes himself as him? menaces to society goes, I think no one deserves this level of praise like my boy Monkey D. Luffy. I know when you hear menace to society, the first thing that pops into your mind is some sort of villain. But Luffy is the paradigm of what a menace to society is. A menace to society is someone that proves to everyone in the world that society is flawed. And that's exactly what Luffy does again and again and again throughout the One Piece journey. If you think of what a pirate is, Luffy is not what pops into your head, but if you think what order and regulation is, Luffy is also the opposite of what pops into your head. Ironically enough, with Gear 5th being released in the manga and being one of the coolest power-ups of all time, and with Gear 5th about to release in the anime, which will probably be one of the most cataclysmically impressive anime episodes in history, I think it's so worth mentioning that his devil fruit, his power, his unlocking of Gear 5th is exactly the embodiment of everything that he is. He is a being that does not fit within the confines of anything that's trying to shackle him down. Whether it's laws, whether it's immorality, or whether it's physics itself. This is a man that breaks every rule that's ever been created and makes new rules just to tear them down moments later. I love how in a story like One Piece, where there is no good and evil, where you can argue that Akainu wanting the freaking world to be subservient to a government, well, that's kind of good, right? Isn't obeying laws important so that people aren't just free reign going around murdering people? But he takes it to an extreme. 
an extreme that's so strong it completely limits the freedom of everyone around them. Whereas you have the complete polar opposite of Akainu, someone like Blackbeard, for example, who's an absolute anarchist. He believes the strong should take. Ironically enough, Blackbeard is the largest proponent to freedom in the entire One Piece world, but with complete freedom, completely devoid of any form of morality, you devolve into complete destruction where only someone like Blackbeard can survive. And yes, Blackbeard is also a menace to society. I might be talking about him later at some point, who knows? But in my humble opinion, Blackbeard embodies what a pirate is, at least as far as the outside looking in. When you think of a pirate, you think of someone that basically does whatever the hell they want, that thinks they are owed everything, and that wants to become the very, very best, the best there ever was. To catch them is his real test, and to train them is his cause. When you think of a pirate, I don't think the first thing that pops into your mind is someone like Luffy, someone who believes in friendship, someone who has incredibly powerful morals to adhere to, and I think that's precisely why he is the ultimate menace to society in an anime protagonist. Because no matter what society he walks in, he is a very menace to whatever that is. Whether it's marines or pirates, he threatens everyone's way of life with his completely emboldened, unshakable philosophy and ideology that he is going to stamp all over what they think because he doesn't believe it to be right. He is the perfect paradigm of a menace to society. When I mention that Luffy's a menace to society, my guess is the first thing that pops into your head is potentially one of the most epic scenes in shonen history where Luffy and his squad is standing there facing down the world government at Impel Down. All the decks are stacked against our boys. We got a couple of dudes here. Just some guys being dudes standing on some buildings being like, you took our friend and we want her back. The government is unwavering and unshaking. No one has ever escaped a buster call, let alone at his lobby. This place is a goddamn fortress. No one's ever been able to survive this. This is something that is a damn fact in the world of One Piece. Few things are certain, but one is the doom of anyone that faces the world government in open combat. The biggest bald pirates on the planet do not go at head-to-head -head war with the world government. They know that's a death sentence, and even if they just barely do manage to win, another emperor will swoop in and steal everything from them. Because of all the powers at B, no one can actually fight in a massive, full-scale battle because it leaves them too weak to whenever they get third-partied by some idiots playing Fortnite. But what if someone doesn't care? What if someone doesn't care about the consequences to the point that they are willing to do anything, no matter what it is, as long as it fits into their virtues? As Luffy and his dude being bros, a couple of himbos standing on a building staring down the world government and their absolute highest tier level of assassins. Luffy whispers to this masked man Soga King, who I still don't know who he is under the mask, shoot down their flag. This is the moment where Luffy declares war on the world government. Luffy, not with an army. No, Luffy with like five dudes. All right, five, just a couple of guys. Just a couple of dudes. And they declare war on the world. The world government, the strongest force in the entirety of One Piece. A force so strong that its rule has not been shaken in 900 years. And he declares war. Through that entire arc, I think it's one of the most powerful arcs in all of anime, and I don't think we will ever, ever have another Ennis Lobby that hits quite the way that one did. But the reason why I put so much passion into talking about that one moment in specificness is not only because it made my panties incredibly moist. No. Well, yes, but, but also no. That's what you think of when you think of Luffy as a menace to society. Here you have the world government. That's a society. Luffy declares war. He be a menace. He is so much more than that. You are severely downplaying exactly what Luffy is if you think he's only a menace to that one society. This man is a menace to all societies. This man has taken down emperors. He's embarrassed emperors, humiliated emperors, and well, maybe even killed emperors if Oda would kill off characters in One Piece. No matter what he does or where he goes, he's constantly making allies. He's causing the common folk to embrace his philosophy, embrace his majesty, worship him as someone worthy of servitude, and starting a rebellion just because he's freaking there. A menace to society is someone who walks in to dress Rosa when there's a massive tournament of dozens of different fleets, and when he leaves Dressrosa, they are all adorning his flag. 
A menace to society is someone who walks into Wano, a country that has been secluded forever, and walks out when it's acting now as a free nation in entirety. A menace to society is someone who walks into a society with four powerful emperors, a world government, the Marine Corps, the Revolutionary Army, and he changes the very history of the world he's in. The status quo is no longer quo! I'm sorry, I really just had to harp on this point in specificality because every time I hear someone talk about Luffy, that he's a good guy, that he's freaking political in some way or another, dude, you so don't understand everything and how terrifying Luffy truly is. Can you imagine One Piece if it wasn't a battle shonen? Can you imagine this one underdog dude with his own ideology? He's not Democrat, he's not Republican, he just he has his own mindset. He, he's kind of wild, he's kind of crazy, he thinks in ways that other people don't really think. He kind of acts childish, he doesn't really care about the consequences of any of his actions. This man freaking punched a celestial dragon because he disagreed with the, the ideology of selling these fish people to forbidders, causing an entire massive eruption and destruction of Sabbath Ar Archipelago just because he freaking felt like it because what that, that dude, that, that idiot with the spacesuit did was wrong and he was not going to let that fly. The fact that this man's gonna go up against a literal god like Enel in a place that has no impact at all on his journey to become Pirate King because how dare Enel pronounce himself as the divine ruler of these people? Someone that thinks that way, someone that doesn't act out of self-interest. Can you imagine this single dude becoming the president of the United States? If that's not the most destructive powerhouse in the history of politics, I don't know what is. That is a menace to society. He shook everything that everyone knew to its very core, and he is slowly but surely making such a powerful mark on the world that it will not be the same after his sandals get lifted from the balls of his enemies. Luffy isn't just a dude being bro, and he ends up strong, and because of his strength, he manages to pull off incredible things. It's Luffy's mindset, it's his ideology, and the actions that he takes to prove that he's not acting purely in some sort of self-serving fashion. It's the fact that he does things and says things that resonate with people to their core, because this man is speaking the truth. It's the fact that this man is changing the world he is walking on. That's what makes Luffy him. He's this dude who came from nothing in some hick town village of nothingness. He has some random devil fruit power that's not even on the radar as something dangerous until way later when we find out that it is. He's someone that has the odds against him every step of the way because he is moral, because he is not willing to backstab, to pilfer, plunder, and pillage. But because of his genuineness, because of him being who he truly is and fighting for what he truly believes in, he ends up becoming much more of a menace to the very workings of every society in the One Piece world. On the one hand, you could say he's like a Kainu. He is someone who doles out justice. And on the other hand, you could say he's like Blackbeard. He doesn't believe that anyone should be subservient to anyone but themselves. Luffy is the perfect blend of everything, which makes him a complete terror to every antagonist in the story. I have never seen a world that has built up everything to such an incredible degree. I think One Piece is probably the best world building of any story I've ever read. And every single society, faction, and character that we bump into along the way has one thing in common. Luffy is an absolute menace to their way of life and their world will forever change. <laughs> In the shadowed corners of a fictional realm, there exists an enigmatic figure, seemingly harmless in appearance but harboring a malevolent essence beneath the surface. This entity exudes an aura of manipulation and discord, effortlessly entangling those nearby with a charming yet sinister facade. His motives remain shrouded in obscurity and his intricate web of schemes defies comprehension, ensnaring others within his eldritchian grasp like a cosmic horror from beyond the stars, his insatiable hunger for power and control transcends mortal understanding, leaving those who encounter him paralyzed by fear. Unveiling his true nature feels akin to peering into an abyss, one that reflects a darkness far beyond the realm of human comprehension. If I were talking about some sort of absolute mad lad, some character of extreme strength and renown, 
Perhaps he wouldn't be as terrifying as the person I'm actually talking about. I am talking about the truly biggest menace to society I have ever witnessed in my many years of consuming media. As someone that has always felt drawn to an anime menace or two, I have never ever seen a character exude this level of malice and cruelty and straight up Eldritchian cosmic horror as the insurmountably terrifying and evil child that is Eric Hartman from South Park. Every once in a while, a character so evil and so cruel shows up that even I, someone who relates to every single psychopath on the planet, cannot even get myself to even slightly respect and love this man. I am someone who has openly stated that Hisoka from Hunter x Hunter is a character that I have nothing but respect for, and uh, I adore him, okay? He is my favorite character in the show, and just that statement has gotten me cancelled on Twitter in the past, and so I'll say it again because Twitter is known for, you know, reusing ammo, so I'm sure that uh, they're gonna love this one. But even I, the, the guy that relates to every psychopath and sociopath in fiction, cannot bring myself to relate to Cartman. He is too menacing for even me. When you think of a menace to society, I honestly can't think of any character that embodies that better than Cartman. You have someone like the Joker who everyone talks about as a menace because he killed some dude or he's crazy or he blows shiz up for the fun of it. Cartman is everything and more. I think there needs to be a level of pettiness that comes alongside a menace to society to really be considered a menace. Because when someone has a really good motivation, they are somewhat predictable in the fact that when they are motivated to do something cruel and horrible, they'll do it. You see, Cartman does not even need a motivation. His pettiness makes him even scarier. The fact that th this gingy kid or whatever is pissing him off, so he decides the correct course of action would be to cause the death of the kid's parents, take their corpses, are you following? Grind them up, are you still listening? Turn them into chili, are you following and listening and following and listening? And feed the parent chili to the son as a flex. Literally as revenge. Literally to be like, ha ha, you just ate your parents, you just ate your parents. And he starts actually literally dancing around talking about it. This is not someone to write off as just a kind of an asshole. This is someone who has taken the meaning of menace to society and flipped it on its head to the point that he embodies the phrase better than any other character in fictional history. The fact that this literal child wanted to take his friend's place and get invited to a party in Casa Bonita so he convinces his friend that the friend's entire family was killed in an apocalypse and hides him in a bunker where he thinks the entire world has ended in order to take his place and go to a party because, well, that slot opened up. This is aside from all the incredibly insensitive things he said about, you know, black people and Jews and gay people and trans people and any other possible group you could think of that he has definitely said slurs about and made fun of in the past, that at this point, all that incredibly cancelable stuff on Twitter, that's not what makes him a menace to society. That makes him edgy if you compare it to the absolute depth that he goes in order to truly dr dig graves for his adversaries. In my relatively shallow experience with South Park, I have seen some things that this twisted child of oblivion has done that makes my hair stand up and makes my penis shrivel. This man ended up contracting AIDS for whatever reason. It's a South Park plot. It doesn't matter. And someone's like, Kyle, his friend's like, bro, Cartman got AIDS. That's kind of funny, because he's always, like, making fun of gay people and stuff. So you know what Cartman does? You know what this little fucking savage monster does? You know what this absolute menace to society decides to do? In the middle of the night, he breaks into Kyle's house. He takes a syringe and takes out some of his blood. <laughs> and he pours it into Kyle's mouth while he's sleeping. He literally gives Kyle AIDS so that the next day, he can make fun of him for it. Bro, this is his best friend. Imagine what he does to his enemies. Just for the meme of it, he gives a pair of goggles to his friend, and he's like, yo, this is an Oculus Rift. Anything that happens in the goggles is just part of a video game. It's not actually real. 
and with the goggles, he manipulates his friend into hurting people around them and assaulting his own parents because he thinks it's part of a game. And Cartman's just there cackling like, ah, what a knee slapper. We totally fooled him. Prank, bro. This is a little child that is so cruel, vindictive, and manipulative. There is nothing I could possibly say that puts him in any form of redeeming light whatsoever and put him in any form of fashion that doesn't label him as a menace to society. He watches some videotapes about Hitler and he becomes a raging anti-Semite. So what does he do? You're probably thinking, well, he probably, you know, says some not nice things to Jews or something. I mean, we've watched Sneeko online. He says not nice things to Jews because he's an anti-Semite. No, 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 you little fool. Man literally cosplays Hitler and forms a new Third Reich. Man literally goes up there and starts giving incredibly terrible speeches convincing people with the, an ungodly power of charisma to turn an entire town into neo-Nazis. If that's not a menace to society, I don't know what is. And this isn't the only time this little child has exhibited such an incredible level of manipulation to the point that an entire society collapsed beneath his incredibly large stomach. We fat shame on this channel, but only when it's deserved. Now, I am not a menace to society. I am the cure. <laughs> God damn it, I'm gonna get so canceled. It gets to the point that the principal of the school tells Wendy, this girl that this freaking asshole Cartman has been harassing for the last 20 freaking seasons. The principal turns to Wendy and says to Wendy, I know you're supposed to fight Cartman right now and you promised that you wouldn't fight him and stuff like that, but let me tell you a thing about cancer because I had breast cancer. Cancer must be destroyed. Cancer is a cruel thing that adds nothing to the world, and cancer should be annihilated. She basically provokes Wendy into beating the crap out of Cartman in front of anybody, which again is incredibly cathartic and potentially one of the greatest times I've ever seen a man eat dirt. Like, my God, all these new Hollywood shows that's putting, you know, getting women to beat up men, blah, blah, blah. South Park is teaching you how to write a strong female character. <laughs> And I'm literally gonna get so canceled. Why? Why do I do this to myself? I like put my whole foot in my mouth every time. But if the principal of the school is more or less advocating for violence toward a literal child, well then this literal child is quite the issue. Now, I've mentioned all of these things that goes to show that he is without a doubt a menace to society. He is a chaotic force that definitely should not be underestimated and should not be respected. I have talked a lot about different menaces to society in my time, whether it's manipulation or it's just straight up power level of destruction. Cartman has both. Cartman is so manipulative and evil that he manages to convince the outer entity, you know, the outer God, the Lovecraftian deity Cthulhu, to become his friend. This man manipulates Cthulhu into obeying his every order and just starts basically zapping people out of existence. This man is not just a threat on a physical level or on an emotional level, but this man is a threat on a psychological level. Batman with prep time would have no chance against this literal child. Goku would be annihilated from the face of the earth because of the demonic and unaging evil within Cartman. I don't even want to picture a reality where this literal Satan spawn grows up. And thankfully, I won't, because he's forever immortalized in this creepy, cartoonish South Park art style, and he will never, ever escape it. If anyone ever asks you, wait a second, you're a Nux fan? Don't you know that he supports murdering children? Your response should be, only if they deserve it. And why am I doing this to myself? I literally don't need to do this. Why? You're welcome, X.com. I'm out here giving you content forever. Over the course of many seasons, we've seen South Park go through many iterations of Cartman's evil carnage and terror. But one thing is for certain, this man, without a shadow of a doubt, is absolutely one of the biggest menaces to society I have ever witnessed. And he is someone that should not be taken lightly in the slightest. It's kind of ironic. I talk about actual gods among men, demons destroying humanity, the absolute most terrifying and powerful of humankind, and to be frank, the one that can defeat almost all of them. 
when it comes to menacing this uh, to society, it is this literal child from an American cartoon. And not even diabetes could stop him. I know we view South Park through the lens of it's just comedy, but if you even take the briefest of moments and look at this character as an actual character for a moment, you are witnessing the eyes of the abyss. Because when you stare at it, it stares right back at you. Eric Cartman, the biggest ever menace to society. More often than not, I believe every society wants someone to save them. There is some legend, some tale, some bit of folklore that is just waiting for that one bright night, that messiah, if you will, that one person to drag them out of the dregs of darkness. Whether it was some political figure, whether it was some online influencer, or whether it was a talk show host that people somehow listen to. I don't know why people still listen to talk show hosts, but anyway, I digress. That is not the point here. A lot of people live forever in a mindset of where they want to be saved. They don't think they need to be the change they want to see in the world. Someone will be there that they can hang their hat on their coattails. This fuels cults. This fuels religions. This fuels political factions that don't actually want to hear anything critically, but will just follow the masses regardless because that one person probably knows better than them. Sometimes there is a born leader, someone that you could truly look up to and respect in every possible way. Have you ever considered that that person that you rely on with your very, very entire being is someone that just using you for his own purposes and waiting for the correct moment to cast you aside? In my opinion, someone that you think you could trust that betrays you is always so much more terrifying than someone that is outwardly evil and heinous that you know you should be staying away from. In my opinion, that is the real mark of a menace to society. Out of all the thousands of comrades and tens of thousands of enemies, only one only you, and you alone, obscured the vision of my dream. When I talk about menaces to society, you think I'm talking about massive powerhouses that are causing all sorts of destruction, where you have some city and all of a sudden, boom, the city's gone. Oh my God, a menace to society. Well, yes, that definitely does qualify as a menace to society in my book, but the subtle menace is something that I find honestly even more terrifying more often than not. The subtle menace is the close friend, is the close confidant, is the person that you've been fighting alongside your entire life. Whether you're a content creator and it's someone you collab with frequently, whether it's a close partner of yours that decides to cheat on you, or whether it's a boss, a father figure, a father that decides to leave because you started an OnlyFans. <laughs> someone that you genuinely trust and believe in, but you are just another layer on a pyramid scheme that will eventually crumble at the bottom. In my opinion, these are the biggest menaces to society. And I'm not just talking about people that are affecting you on a personal level. I mean someone that is so powerful, so charismatic, so emblematic of a future you want to believe in and believe it exists. That person that lets you down can be so much worse. And I'm not just talking about letting you down. I mean genuinely using your corpse as a stepping stool to get to a higher place. Imagine living your entire life being tortured, being beaten down, being hated by being a villain to society and villainizing society in turn. You have nowhere to go, but there is that one light, that one person that does reach out to you, that you will join them, you will become their friend, you will fight alongside them and you would give your life putting your very essence on the line to get them to achieve whatever they have dreams or hopes or aspirations for. Someone that you truly believe would do the same for you. When suddenly, none of that is true. And suddenly you realize that you are just a tool to them. They are going to use you to get to greater heights. So you leave them. You abandon them. You cut ties because this is a toxic relationship, the very definition of that. But you still love them despite making this distance because you truly didn't understand how corrupt the inner working of their mind really was. They'll find themselves in issues. They will find themselves in trouble because anyone that really likes to push buttons and manipulate to that degree will eventually spiral completely out of control and will not be able to escape the fires and explosions that they've created. They will eventually find themselves in a position of absolute torment and torture to the worst possible degree. Now you are left with a choice. Do you go help them? This person that technically manipulated you but truly gave you a reason to live for so many years? Or do you keep that toxic relationship severed? 
Well, the correct answer is to keep the toxic relationship severed, but at anyone looking at it from that perspective at that time, they don't really feel like that's something they can do. They feel like they owe it to this person who, yeah, kind of was an asshole at times, but is someone that truly helped them. Only to find out that once you help them again, they take it to even a further step and cause absolute destruction and the worst type of betrayal to you and everyone that you know. There is nothing truly as evil as betrayal. Because yeah, I think every Everyone in their mind recognizes the fact that there are good guys, there are bad guys in the world. You don't really know what anyone is behind the scenes, and as long as there's a distance between you and them, you you have your basic guidelines. Is the person a murderer or a rapist? Well, then they're probably a bad guy. But someone that you truly love and truly believe in, that betrayal, well, that's so much worse. Because in your mind, that is someone who has lived in your life as the good side, on the tit side of the force, if you will. Then it turns out those tits were never real. Sometimes someone's out there trying to do everything in your life for you, being that father figure, being that mentor figure, being that person that you could truly trust and believe in, and it turns out they were just all cock and no cum. That's like the worst thing ever. Now, imagine that not just done on a personal level where you were betrayed. Imagine it done on a societal level. Imagine some sort of crazy apocalyptic time where the entire world is terrified of an upcoming event, whether it's being attacked by demons or it's some crazy upcoming nuclear war. Maybe it's some incredible, terrifying political campaign where a absolute monster dictator can come into power and change your entire way of life. But there's that one person that could fight it. Maybe it's the opposing political figurehead. Soda! Or maybe it's some sort of incredible messiah-like figure that can take down all of these demonic hordes that are plaguing you, whether they're conscious or not. The truly manipulative, the truly vindictive, those are the true menaces to society. It's not the ones that are going around blowing up buildings. It's not the ones that are shaking political empires. It's not the ones that are so powerful with the push of a button they can start a war. Those lads are menacing too. But in my opinion, the subtle menace to society will always be be so, so much scarier. Imagine living your life not knowing that society is an instant away from absolute and complete collapse as you know it. The entire world is about to change, but you think that you are two steps away from peace, from financial stability, from political stability. But you were sold a lie. You are merely another corpse for them to stand upon. And if you don't think a subtle flex is truly scary, if you don't think the subtle menace to society is by far more terrifying than any of the big public grandstandings and grandiose power displays, if my brilliant fake tits analogy has not convinced you yet at what a true menace to society is, how is it that I have gone for the last 10 minutes talking about the incredible menace that is Griffith despite not once mentioning his name or the series Berserk in the entire last 10 minutes of me talking. How is it that I painted a picture for you to know exactly who I'm talking about and also be able to attribute it to all these other people in your lives? Maybe you've been looking at it through the lens of the anime character specifically. Maybe you've been kind of connecting the dots to personal betrayals you felt. I don't know what you've been doing for the last 10 minutes. Maybe you've just been thinking about Griffith, but I wouldn't know because I did not mention the man a single time for the last 10 minutes. I painted a perfect picture of a perfect menace to society, attacking you in the most subtle ways. A subtle way so subtle that I have not even mentioned the subject matter of this video a single time throughout this entire analysis. You can check if you want. You could go back. You could rewind it. I got the script in front of me, baby. I was, this was all part of my 4D genius plan. Maybe I was the subtle menace to society all along. You trusted me to be talking about an anime character. You don't even know if I was talking about Griffith. I didn't even mention the guy. Can we talk about Andrew Tate? <laughs> but if you truly had Griffith in mind the entire time of me making this video, despite the fact that I never mentioned him a single time, then I don't need to be the one to tell you that he truly is one of the biggest menaces in anime history. You're not. When covering menaces to society, whether it's an anime or any other form of fiction, I always have relative glee. You see, according to a large enclave of Twitter, I am classified as a menace to society. There is a relatability in what 
is a menace to society. Because since society is generally cringe, said menace to said society would be de facto kind of based. That all ends here. I've covered characters in the past that were a menace to society that were not necessarily the best of people. Some were revered and terrifying in their disruption of societal events, despite being genuinely good people. I feel nothing less than a moral obligation to cover possibly the most traumatizing menace to society I have ever witnessed. I don't want to be the person that puts this on your radar if you've somehow managed to avoid it. I don't want to ruin your life by telling you about a person so vulgar and disturbed, so unfathomably unhinged and cruel as Keiaru in Redo of Healer. I feel like this could be the shortest video of all time. I could literally just describe the plot to you vaguely. And I don't need to actually get into any of the details of any of the horrible things that have transpired in this anime. And you will already immediately understand for your own sanity. If you have not seen Redo of Healer or know anything about it, I suggest you leave this stone unturned. You have been warned. Keiaru, our protagonist, is a healer in an anime. Healers are basically the bitch boys of the party in every single show ever. And this guy is no exception. He just goes around. He's part of a squad. They're fighting the demon lord lady and everything's going according to plan. I mean, it's a typical fantasy anime. And well, this dude, he's clearly treated as, I guess, the runt of the litter. But he manages to, with the help of his party, defeat the demon lord and obtain the epic ultra mega gem, which he then uses. The mega gem thingy can basically invoke this epic demonoid power. And with it, he can do... It doesn't matter. The plot exists and, and this, this will activate plot power to launch us directly into probably the most most obscene story in the history of fiction, he then activates this gem and goes back in time. Back before he was ever in this party. Back in time to before he ever fought the demon lord. He goes back in time to a simple point of his life where he was just some kid with an affinity to healing magic that was about to get recruited by the princess to be part of her squad and help her defeat the demon lord. Now, you don't know exactly what went on, but he was a little bit harassed when he was joining that party originally. They kind of treated him pretty badly and you get to see how badly they treated him. So when he joins this whole palace thing, the princess, who's a complete bitch, by the way, trying to justify your feelings of what is about to happen. To make a very long story short, his ability to heal is incredibly powerful. The sword saint epic whammon of awesomeness got her arm chopped off and that's really rough and he's able to heal that. He can regenerate her arm. By doing that, he feels all the pain that she felt by her arm being removed. So when the, the freaking Freya Princess Biatch makes him heal all sorts of incredible injuries. He is feeling all the pain and suffering that they all went through and she does not care even a little bit. Also, because he's a protagonist in a fantasy revenge anime and he has to be incredibly broken, he also manages to obtain all the powers of all the people that he heals. Listen, who fucking cares, man? He ends up in prison only used for his healing where he is forced to drink this crazy aphrodisiac potion thing that makes him fall in love with her and then he can't live without her and all also, at the same time, he's forced to keep healing and he's tortured and he lets all this happen, even though this is the second time around that you know what's going on, just for the sake of feeling the vindication and justification of when he takes his revenge. I'm gonna cut to the chase. He breaks out of his prison cell. He goes to the princess. He, of course, fucks with all the guards on the way because he's a menace to society and it's not just women that are his enemy. Women are just the ones that he seems to take pleasure in humiliating, destroying, and murdering. He goes to the princess lady and he says to her, <laughs> Oh shit, this is getting bad. So he breaks her fingers one by one. She's holding back. She's doing a great job. Her hands are in agony. She is sitting there with all her fingers broken. And he says to her, well, you did a really good job not screaming until now. Anyway, he uses his healing magic to heal all nine of her fingers and starts breaking them again. The deal was if all 10 fingers could be broken and they're not because they'll keep re-breaking them. Eventually she screams and he says, oh, well, you lost the game. And he goes and he takes an iron rod from amidst the coals in burning heat and he walks up to her and he says <laughs> 
This man is not only a menace to society, he is a menace to humanity. I don't know who wrote this manga, but whoever freaking did has forever altered the way God sees his children. He then proceeds to have a very long scene of him and then with his healing magic somehow, I don't know, I guess he managed to yoink one of these powers off somebody else or whatever, he erases her memories and he instills within her new memories. He changes her face to look slightly different, changes her memories as the person that is madly in love with him and someone that can only see him as justice. Now, I know you're probably thinking like, damn, this is like some epic conclusion to this 12 episode anime. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the least bad thing Kearu has done, and this was one episode. For the rest of the anime, she is his humble servant, completely in love with him, constantly throwing herself at him, and you know that this person, biologically, is this princess lady whose very identity was stripped from her in the most brutal possible fashion. The story keeps going, and he keeps doing these things, and they get worse and worse and worse. Everyone from the beast race wants help and stuff because humans are wiping them out, so he sleeps with her. <laughs> <laughs> and then helps her, and then sleeps with her again. My man is a twisted, twisted figure, a twisted person that can twist anyone's mind to his very will, and he is a sadistic monster with everything that he does. There is no menace quite as menacing and as disruptive to society as a whole as him. He is so twisted, in fact, that he starts a rebellion against the capital just because he kind of doesn't like them. He changes the princess's changed face back to look like the princess to give give orders. So everyone's like, oh my god, the princess is giving us orders. And she, the princess, thinks she isn't the princess, only acting as the princess, giving the orders. It is literally the most twisted possible conceivable premise and way that he uses these characters in the most disgusting and vile ways. He doesn't invade their privacy. He invades their identity. And I love how before every character that he ends up doing these horrible things to, before he actually does them, they give you a really good picture of why this character is kind of a bad person, and then they probably show you the most obscene possible way to humiliate, destroy, and kill them. Like, uh, there's this arc where this guy ends up killing some villager. The villager is coincidentally the mother of this Kearu guy, and Kearu, despite being the epic healer, can't heal her because he needs a reason why he doesn't like this person. Now, this person is part of a band, part of a group that's working for the castle, and these people, they're, they're not nice to the peasants, to the mere mortals. They take their money, they they rape them, they abuse them, they do all sorts of horrible stuff, they kill them, yeah, they're not good people! And the show wants you to know that they're not good people. And then the show shows you what he does to these not good people, and you start to realize, oh my god, I, I, I think that the main guy's worse. He goes to this person who killed his mom, and he uses again his face warping shenanigans to transform the person into looking some hot villager girl. He he also manages to cast some crazy invigorating spell of some sort to all of that person's compatriots so that they are all incredibly strong, incredibly horny, and will never stop thrusting. He literally transforms this guy into a girl and then forces that guy girl's posse into raping her him until they die. I don't want to keep going and keep expressing to you every vile thing Kearu has done throughout the show because there is no way to express how how evil he is without actually watching it. His internal monologues constantly just make you reminded how cruel and depraved he is. Every time he's there with his whole harem of whammon that he's managed to assemble each one of them by manipulating, lying, and physically altering them to be nothing more than his cock slaves, he's thinking in his mind, So that's the right. But what do you this man is a monster. He's worse than a monster. I can't even believe that fiction created a being this horrible. There's this one scene of some serial killer rapist guy who keeps kidnapping women and stuff, torturing them and killing them. This serial rapist is, of course, some hot girl herself because the show doesn't believe in him actually torturing men. It, it's only torturing hot women. And if it is a man that he's going to be torturing and brutalizing for some weird fetish thing, he's going to turn him into a woman first so that somehow the weird fetish stuff... Can... Well, this video is getting mega demonetized. So anyway, what does he do with his all-powerful magic? You'd probably think, oh, he just freaking flies up there and kills her. No, 
No, no. First, we have to realize how bad that person is before we see exactly how far they go here. So, uh, he transforms himself into a cute, innocent girl, walks down the street, lets himself get captured and raped, only for him to then transform back into his normal self, and... It's every arc, it's every chapter, it's every season, it's every episode, and there is no escaping the absolute trauma that this will drop upon your head like a sack of bricks. Redo of Healer might be the worst thing ever created, but when I'm covering the biggest menaces to society, I don't think it's fair to mention other characters, like, in playful ways. I'm talking about people like, oh, Bill Cipher freaking warped the world around. God damn, what a kooky mad lad that dude is. Oh yeah, Eric Cartman, he freaking gave his friend AIDS and made friends with Cthulhu. But how can I really talk about menaces to society without crowning the absolute king of depravity himself? Without crowning a man that is such a menace to society, every single person that crosses his path, he will find some sort of ambiguous way to justifiably cause them every form of conceivable trauma, and he'll be laughing, cackling, and giggling all the while while doing it. He is the opposite of justice. He is the penultimate menace to society. It has been said that the most dangerous aspect of society is comedy. What people do for the sake of comedy and entertainment is potentially some of the most dangerous and society collapsing motivations anyone could have. Yes, there are people that fight for justice. There are people that fight for freedom. There are people that fight for greed, but there are people that fight for comedy. Those are the people that are pushing the envelope further and further, destroying and reshaping society as we know it. Sometimes, especially if you look on Twitter or X.com, <laughs> what a cool name. You see people vilified for the sake of comedy. You see people destroyed for the sake of comedy. However, because of this comedy, they will forever be remembered. Their comedy shakes the status quo. Sometimes the most profound ideas are transmitted through comedy, and sometimes the most terrible and hateful ideas are as well. If it's coming from a comedic standpoint, we could look at it and be like, oh, well, it's just comedy, and we will not necessarily need to even worry about the underlying demonic tendencies underneath. Now, I am a big fan of free speech. I think comedy, if it's funny, even if it's edgy, has a place that it deserves to exist. But what happens when your comedy comes in tandem with your power? What if all of a sudden you can reshape the very world around you because of something you subjectively find funny? What if you take something like, let's say, Twitter, a landmark of the internet, and change it to an X, a stupid freaking X symbol, because you find that funny? Suddenly, your subjective comedy is changing the lives of everyone around you. And there is no one funnier, and no one more terrifying, no one more menacing, and no one whose sense of humor has destroyed more lives than the Dorito of Doom himself, one of my favorite characters in the history of animation, Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls. a mystery story, but it's definitely layered into comedy and character growth, and it's all in all a family-friendly show that I think everyone can enjoy. In fact, it's one of those shows that is pretty much my go-to recommendation to literally anyone of any age, and no matter what genres are their favorites, and no matter how many pieces they can fit in their asshole, Gravity Falls is exactly what you need to scratch that itch that you have been missing for the longest of times. And straight up, yes, Everything about the show is great. All the characters are fun and the stories are cool and the mysteries are funny and, and you know, the, all in all, it's just everything you could possibly want wrapped up in a beautiful little tale for all ages, especially Bill Cipher. This character is a character that from a very superficial level is absolutely terrifying. And from a much deeper level, if you start looking into his character and his motivations is even scarier. When I think of a true menace to society, I think that Bill Cipher's triangle is ingrained into my mind as one of the first things I think of every time. I just love that his character design is basically the Illuminati, the father, the godfather of conspiracies. 
and all of a sudden he's here in all of his two-dimensional glory, there to just change the world around him for laughs and gaffs, for goops and giggles, because this is the mind of the tragic god of Bill Cipher. Now, if you look at this man's backstory and motivations, you can kind of understand that he is someone that's always been alone, always been trapped in an alternate reality because he's just far too dangerous. Now, from our perspective, this makes sense. Th this is a literal god whose sense of humor is not one to be trifled with. But on the other hand, this is a man in solitude alone for eternity. He's an immortal being confined to a dimension of loneliness, which is the saddest thing in the world. So from our perspective, we can completely comprehend why we don't want him here, but from his perspective, we can completely understand why he wants to be here. Now, all of this in mind leads you to potentially the greatest climax of any show ever, Weird Mageddon. In this three episode finale of Gravity Falls, you understand exactly the terror that is Bill Cipher. Gravity Falls introduces us to a lot of random wacko characters, but Bill Cipher stands above them as this absolute terror, this creature that you see for just a split second in the intro that we can't even begin to understand. We start seeing him invading the minds and the psychologies of characters, offering them deals. With a little handshake, he could give you infinite power and knowledge, but unfortunately, the price is always just a little too steep. This is a man, nay, a god so terrifying that his powers come second to his mind when you think of how scary he is. The first time you see him, the first iteration of Bill Cipher on screen, he says to Dipper, hey kid, do you want a head that's always screaming? And he materializes a head decapitated screaming at him. And Dipper's obviously like, no, I, I, I do not wa want that. Why would you presume that I do? And he's just like, <laughs> oh, I cracked myself up. This is when you start to realize that you are not dealing with a perfectly sane individual. You start to realize that even scarier than the fact that this person was able to materialize a floating head screaming out of nothing is the fact that he thought that was something he should do. He encroaches upon the conscious of all the characters really slowly throughout the show, trying fruitlessly to invade reality through making deals with different characters to control different people's bodies by offering them things where he can get tiny little things that seem completely innocuous in return. Little by little, this man is slowly seeping into the reality that we call home, and it starts to terrify us more and more. He is a menace to society without even being present in the same dimension as the characters for the entire story until the last three episodes. And once he actually does, obtain physicality once he does step foot in our home turf everything changes weird mageddon changes everything we know about the world it changes the sky into memes it turns the people into stone that he can use as his throne as a meme he is funny above all else his fortress is a floating pyramid in the sky just flying around with hands creeping everywhere he summons beings from other dimensions that he thinks are cute and funny he traps people in their own subconscious just to kind of see what would happen. He calls his paradise, his utopia, Weird Mageddon, because for him, that is exactly what is utopia. A utopia is a world of absolute anarchy where the party never ends. His idea of a fun time is hell on this earth for everyone around, and he has the power to create that reality. Before he even intrudes reality, and he just takes over Dipper's body for a couple of minutes here and there, he punches himself in the face and he's like, wow, pain is hilarious. He is a character that walks around the world thinking that reality is illusion and the universe is a hologram. He is someone that truly feels like the world is better off with him because he could make the world a true utopia in his own image of what is funny and weird and kooky and quirky. It's a living nightmare for everyone, but for the tragic god that is Bill Cipher, that's exactly what makes it interesting. This is a character with godlike power, a character so strong no one can even hope to defeat him. A character so terrifyingly powerful, he would slap Goku. And yes, at this point I only say it to annoy the Dragon Ball fans, but whatever, he probably could. His terrifying aspect is not that he could shape reality into whatever he wants. He's terrifying because of what's going on in his mind. A completely unpredictable, terrifying cacophony of the most psychotic and edgy sense of humor alive. This is the reality of Bill Cipher. This is why Bill Cipher is the ultimate menace 
to society. Thank you so much if you've made it this far covering the seven deadly sins of menaces to society. I think that this is a much better way to tackle the different types of menaces as opposed to just, you know, listing 50 of them or just talking about generic qualities. If you like this video, please do let me know. And please let me know if there are any other topics you want me to deep dive in this fashion. Leave a like, subscribe, and remember, try not to have a sense of humor in 2023 or it might be the last thing you ever do. Society will label you as a menace, Twitter will hate you, and you will be in the NUX blacklisted side of YouTube, which sucks. Stay weird, fam.